Let me welcome all of you. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you here today. We have a fantastic guest and a vital subject and really looking forward to our conversation. Today, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Dr. Kelly Mack. You see, we've been thinking and working at the, on the Future Trends Forum about the question of equity for the past two years very closely. We've been tracking this and discussing it and exploring it in multiple directions. This is the first time, however, that we're looking at equity in the light of STEM disciplines. How can we get more underrepresented populations into STEM majors? How can we get them to graduate successfully? Dr. Mack is someone who works on this from the wonderful position of being the VP for undergraduate STEM education at the American Association of Colleges and Universities, which is an enormous organization that covers a great, great network of campuses. She's also the executive director of Project Kaleidoscope. So she's here to show us what she's learned about how best to support underrepresented minorities in STEM and what we can do moving forward. Let me beam her up on stage so she can join us. Welcome, Dr. Mack. Hi, Brian. How are you? Is my audio okay? Your audio is crystal. Beautiful. Great. Great. And please call me Kelly. Okay, I can do that. Because we're going to be having conversation, right? I know. I know, but not yeah. everybody does that. So okay. I have to err on the side of prudence, Kelly. It's funner so, this way. Yeah, I agree. And you can call me Brian or that hairy guy, either way. Okay. I'll um, Kelly, first of all, welcome. Thank you for taking an hour out of your busy schedule to talk with us. I really appreciate that. Thanks for having me. I'm well, glad, glad to be here. Oh, good. Well, we have a tradition of, of asking people to introduce themselves in an unusual way. That is to ask you, what are you going to be working on for the next year? What are the big projects, the big topics, the big ideas that are uppermost in your mind? Yeah, that is a, a interesting way of introducing myself. So I just want to say hi to everyone and thank you so much for being here. This is my first time using the shindig platform and so I, i'm just having like fun right now um i really like this platform um i want to say that the biggest thing that we are working on uh, for the next year is ourselves um, yeah. we've been through a lot um, as a result of the pandemic as well and and we know that our colleagues are going through a lot mm -hmm. we want to be a refuge for STEM faculty. Um, we know that they're being called upon to do such Herculean work right now. Uh -huh. And you know, I know you've seen Twitter is just all of us with lamentations of exhaustion and uh -huh. burden and depression and overwhelm. And because we are so committed to being a resource for STEM faculty, we wanna make sure that we're doing our work so we're taking time to reflect. We're taking time to ask critical questions of ourselves. Um, we are taking time to check in with ourselves also and make sure that we're okay as well. Outside of ourselves, outside of AACNU, uh, we're getting all geared up for the STEM conference, which is uh, first week in November, November 4th to 6th. And it is going to be virtual. Uh -huh. um, I'm excited about our lineup of speakers. It's coming together really, really nicely. And I'm just so, so thrilled to have a platform where we're able to welcome new perspectives on STEM teaching, STEM learning. We're able to really thread through this theme of inclusive excellence, not just as uh, the mission of AACNU, but it really is apparent in everything that we do in the STEM conference, from the speakers that we choose to the um, participants that show up to who gets selected for our pre-conference workshops. Um, it is really, really a thrill for me. I'm getting some feedback. Are you, you still okay? I'm still okay? You still sound very good. Okay, great. Um, we are also uh, on Tuesday of next week, we are launching our writing institute. It's called Keystroke, and uh, it is a part of the Center for the Advancement of STEM Leadership. And uh, we're funded by NSF for this center, and it focuses on leadership at HBCUs and specifically leadership for broadening participation. We're going deep into understanding what it is about the role of leadership and how it has translated into the disproportionate success of HBCUs in graduating 
black uh, STEM graduates uh, with bachelor's, master's, PhD degrees in, in the STEM disciplines. So starting next Tuesday morning at 8 a.m. and every yeah. Tuesday morning at 8 a.m. thereafter until uh, about the middle of March when we actually have the Institute, we start meeting for writing sessions. And um, there's not a lengthy presentation. Um, it's just whoever comes, whoever registers. And uh, we start off with a mindfulness meditation mm -hmm. because we want to make sure that we are grounding this work around writing and the narratives of HBCU STEM faculty in the traditions of African-American culture. And so we start off by getting in touch with that part of our history. And then we just we just write. So we start in small doses. Uh, the first one is 30 minutes. So we'll do 30 minutes for a couple of weeks and then we'll graduate to an hour. And then we'll graduate to 90 minutes. And then huh. we'll graduate to the, the entire institute, uh, which is in the middle of March. So just really excited because it's, it's me also making time to do the writing that needs to be done. Um, other than that, we are also looking at our institutes for next summer. And we're asking ourselves some really tough questions about whether or not it should be virtual or in-person or whether or not we should do both. Um, there have been some huge advantages of being able to do virtual institutes. And our institutes are a little different in that they're very interactive and high touch. And, you know, it requires people to be up and out of their seats. Like we take active learning to a new level at our institutes. And we want to be careful before we start to do that in person. We want to make sure it's safe for everyone. Um, but one of the things that doing it virtually helped us do was just invite so many people in who otherwise couldn't have been able to attend an in-person institute. Yes. So we had um, faculty from the West Coast um, for whom travel to the East Coast is sometimes cost prohibitive. Mm -hmm. We had new moms, right, with newborns, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. right? So a couple of moms with newborns on the shoulder. And, and they're participating in, in these institutes and, and just getting an opportunity um, that they otherwise would not have been able to, to take advantage of. So um, lots of hard decisions that we have to make as well as just getting ramped up and getting ready for all of the things that we want to offer to STEM faculty. How's that? That sounds like an awful lot and of an awful lot of great stuff too. Um, I, I really admire your, uh, your um, stepped sessions of writing increasing <laughs> more over time. Yeah, yeah, it helps. Um, it's it's difficult, um, especially when you're starting out, and and our schedules are so hectic and so crazy. And to just say, I'm going to sit down and write for four hours today, or I'm going to sit down and write for two hours today, is not always really feasible, and no. and it's not always really practical. And mm -hmm. when we read. Um, much of the literature that talks about how writing is done, how effective writing is done, mm -hmm. it's usually not the style that we might be used to from undergrad where you just kind of cram it all in because mm -hmm. it's due next week or it's it's due tomorrow. But our goal is is also to to move faculty and ourselves into a habit of writing, just a regular habit of writing. Um, we did the first one. I want to say um, we started in J January of this year. We started with weekly sessions leading up to a virtual institute. And it was interesting. We usually get faculty leaving our institute saying, oh, that was great. I, you know, I really accomplished a lot. But this time, the response and the feedback was, when are we going to start again? I, I miss the Tuesday mornings. You know, I've, I've been doing the Tuesday mornings and are you going to do the Tuesday mornings again? And it's a different kind of feedback for us. Um, it's a little bit more, I think, than just uh, participants or attendees saying that was really great. You know, I got a lot out of it and I'm going to go forth and, and do well. Um, but this feels like faculty saying to us, we appreciate just the opportunity to be in community 
with you and and with each other. And I and I gotta tell you, Brian, the mindfulness meditations are just mm-hmm. extraordinary for us. Um, the way, that? I'm sorry. Why is that? I I I think there are lots of reasons. Um, what I am seeing and sensing is that more often than not, participating in a workshop or an institute, it's a thing to do. Like, I, I got to be there at eight, I'm going to be there at eight, I'm going to do this, I'm going to participate, raise my hand, etc. We work really hard at making sure that when faculty are arriving at our door, virtual or in person, that we are offering them something that is restorative. Mm-hmm. And our mm-hmm. mindful meditation, mindfulness meditations early in the morning are just that, right? It's a moment to just stop and pause, um, to recognize and honor our humanity, to recognize and honor the busyness and and to rise above it for just a few moments and be able to look down on it as opposed to being in the middle of it while it's swirling yeah. all around you. Yeah. So we we start uh, at eight and we we actually um, close the door, the, the virtual door at eight, right? So mm. that we don't have people who might be late coming in and interrupting the flow of the meditation. And everybody comes like at quarter of, right? So they can get ready, be in position, because as soon as eight comes, we do, it it depends on how long the session is. So for a 30 minute session, we might do five or 10 minutes of meditation. For the 90 minute session, the meditation might be for a little longer, 15 or 20 minutes. And um, it is a a time also for us to, to just be in community with each other. And, and be in touch with a, a higher purpose that is calling us to do the kind of work that we're doing um, and a moment to just be centered with ourselves and with the work. That's very, very powerful. That's uh, that's a fantastic, I don't think service is the right word. That's a, a terrific source for AAC and you to offer. Thank you. I do, I, yeah, it, it's not just a service, but it is a service. Um, and and that's how I'm viewing it. I I was a faculty. I, I was faculty member for. Biology. I taught biology. I am a physiologist by training. Ah. Ah. Um, and I understand. I get it. Mm-hmm. Um, I struggled with it. I I struggled with the busyness. I struggled with the overwhelm. Mm -hmm. And it took a physical toll. And while I was experiencing that, I didn't have the skill set to to manage it. I I didn't know what to do with the stress and the angst. It wasn't until much later in my career that I developed the skill set. Otherwise, I'd probably still be faculty if I knew how to manage it. And so I carry that with me in the work that I do now. And my goal is that when someone comes into our space, whether it's virtual um, or in person, that they leave feeling better than when they arrived. Mm -hmm. Yes, there will be some things that we will all learn from each other. Yes, there will be some things, um, some some tangible things that our, our participants We'll walk away with but it's also important to me that we have spent some time honoring the entire faculty person and honoring honoring everyone's humanity and and respecting the way that they are arriving when they come to us and, and usually it's 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 weariness and and mm-hmm. beaten down um mm-hmm. from a tough academic year or from a, a tough semester or from a tough half of semester. And, and I always want to be sensitive to that. I think it makes a difference. I'm so glad to hear that. Um, I, I think I think the whole 
participants swarm. I think people are just uh, thinking hard about this. We have a quick question from uh, Charles Finley, and we just put this on the screen regarding that. Sure. Uh, are the meditations guided? Yes. Hi, Charles. Thank you for your questions. Yes, they are. So uh, Stephanie Briggs uh, is our, I call her our mindfulness teacher. And uh, the way we started um, even talking about mindfulness came out of uh, an initiative that we were uh, implementing, um, our TIDES program, Teaching to Increase Diversity and Equity in STEM. Mm -hmm. And the initial um, cohort of TIDES institutions was primarily comprised of computer science faculty. Hmm. And uh, it was a three year long professional development initiative uh, in the first year, we did a really deep dive into uh, the social science literature, uh, getting into a lot of the radical social science literature. The second mm -hmm. year, we looked at uh, uh, cultural competencies. Mm -hmm. And then in the third year, we um, turned to mindfulness. And it was a way of kind of bringing us full circle because when we started in the first year looking at the social science literature, it was about um, implicit biases and, and those things that we do without thinking about them very often. So we brought that full circle to mindfulness as a way of saying for ourselves, what is it that we can do now that helps us confront the biases that we have on a day-to-day, -day, even moment-by-moment, moment-by-moment -moment, um, moment -moment, um, process. And it was so well received and i don't know if it was like just well received or so well received i felt like it was such a risk with computer scientists and i was nervous about it yeah and and i didn't know if they were just going to just say oh this is ridiculous kel like we're out of here we are so on the plane now <laughs> um but they didn't, and, and they were just, it was just so well received and, and so appreciated by this group. And um, we have been working with Stephanie ever since. Um, and anytime there is a need for us to kind of pause and, and take a breath um, and, and integrate that into the greater work that we do, I take full advantage of it. So. Uh, Stephanie Briggs is there for us for our uh, writing institute uh, last year when we hosted our first virtual STEM conference. Uh, that was really a time um, for us to be thinking about healing and thinking about what is it that we can offer to our colleagues who were just slammed in the middle of um, the, a fall semester and it just looking nothing like what we were um, used to. And so um, we took every morning of the STEM conference and um, provided mindfulness meditations. And so almost any institute that you come to now uh, at AACNU will have some element of, of mindfulness. Um, we really do uh, promote the value of reflection and we use mindfulness as a way of, of our getting to that rapidly and very deeply. And I can see it doing that. Um, I can see that just the way you're talking about it now, doing that for, for all of us. But friends, let, let, let me pause for a second. I've asked a couple of questions, but that's not my job. My job is to help you with your questions and, and your comments. And you can see Charles Finley already led the way with his first. So the floor is yours. What would you like to ask either about the programs that uh, Kelly has just described, including the writing program, the mindfulness exercises, or what would you like to ask her about STEM education and equity? Again, you can just use that raised hand button to join us on stage. I promise we'll be uh, as nice as we possibly can be. Even if you don't have a beard, I'm glad to see you. Um, and just, or click the Q and A button uh, and as Charles just did. Um, now, while people are, are gathering their thoughts and, and prepping their questions, I wanted to read one question uh, that came from a uh, longtime uh, friend of the program who couldn't make it right now. He might be able to join us in a few minutes. Okay. Uh, but he asked a very specific question. 
How are STEM student issues mirrored by STEM faculty DEI issues? I'll read that out loud so everyone can hear that again. Sorry. How are STEM student issues mirrored by STEM faculty DEI issues? And you know, I'm just going to put this up on the screen so everyone can see it too. Let me just paste that up there. Yeah. So that's. I love the question, and it's it's one that I've been thinking of of late. Mm. And here's why. We talk about students, especially from marginalized groups, needing to feel a sense of belongingness, mm. um, needing a nurturing environment in which to learn mm. and to grow. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that we've done enough as faculty to do that for ourselves. Mm. And when I think about what's in the literature, when I think about the ways in which STEM reform is being talked about, even the ways in which professional development is being talked about, there isn't a robust um, resource around, or, or even robust evidence around our paying attention to what's happening with faculty in the context of what we're seeing with students. And we continuously call upon faculty to provide this for students. And so I'm, I'm thinking about um, certainly um, what we see happening with women faculty in STEM. I spent four years as the program director for the advanced program at NSF. Um, advance is um, their signature program for advancing the careers of women in STEM. And it uses institutional transformation as a way of promoting that. And it was not uncommon to hear just such horror stories. I, I want to say I heard the worst horror stories while I was at NSF, but I, I don't think those were the worst. But, but nevertheless, it, it was certainly the case that there were many nuances about what women were experiencing in the STEM Academy and certainly women of color even more so. And when I match that and my experiences around gender equity and the struggles of women in the Academy mm -hmm. with what I do now and the responsibility that we have as faculty to provide a certain kind of environment for our students. And I just can't put the two together. I think about these women, these, these faculty of color who are spent, who are weary, who are being asked now to show up in ways that are supportive of our students. And and, and there is, is where also, Brian, much of um, this wanting that I have to be a refuge and a, and a place of restoration for STEM faculty comes from. Because if they've got to pour out so much for our students and nothing is being, I shouldn't say nothing, but little is being poured into them or little attention is being given to how we pour back into faculty, that is a driver, it's a central driver for me. It's a central driver for our work at AACNU as well. So it's a long way of answering a question of saying, a long way of answering that question, the short way would be to say, absolutely, um, there is a relationship between what we see in terms of what our students struggle with in the academy and what we see marginalized faculty struggle with in the academy. Well, thank you. That's a very, very thoughtful uh, answer to a very, very deep question. Uh, and, and hopefully we'll get the questioner in person to, uh, to follow. Yeah. Uh, we have another question and let me put, okay. this is a longer one and let me just let me put this on stage so everyone can see it. Um, this is, uh, this is from Jim Venides. Uh, I teach teachers online asynchronously a conceptual physics class. While the focus has been the science content and exploration, I haven't considered implicit bias. How do I examine this? 
Wow, Jim, great question. You're doing it. <laughs> You're doing it. Um, examining our implicit biases is about asking ourselves the question. So often we just keep going. And, you know, it, it's like, I, I got to cover this syllabus. I got to cover these topics. If I don't cover these topics, they're not going to be ready when they go on to the next level. But to just stop and ask ourselves the question, is my bias showing up in some way? And kudos to you for teaching online. I taught, um, I taught biology lecture and I taught biology lab online for three mm -hmm. years while I was faculty. And it was the hardest teaching mm -hmm. I have done in my entire life. It was so hard. The, the conceptualiz conceptualization that students online have that you're just there, like there, right there all the time. Whenever they hit send, you're just there to receive it. It was crazy. Um, so I, I admire what you're doing. Um, if I go back and think about how I taught, I didn't pay attention to my biases then either um, while I was teaching online. Um, looking back on it in hindsight, did I have some, some biases? Probably, right? But I didn't even, I wasn't even where you are right now to be conscious, cognizant, mindful enough to ask myself the question. And so it's not that there will be a specific answer that comes up for you, um, or that there will be a right answer or a wrong answer. And it's not that if there is a certain answer today, it will always be that answer. What's important in this process is that we always ask ourselves the question, that we never assume that we're not operating um, through our implicit biases because we all have them. And we rely on them when we are in our hurried states, when we are stressed, when we have very little time. And moving beyond that then just means, should I, can I take a moment and just ask myself about my own biases and, and also being reflective enough to say, did I handle that well? Did I not handle it well? What could I do differently? These are the kinds of of critical reflective moments that we emphasize in our institutes. So it's almost as if you've been at an institute. You might be halfway there. Jim, mm -hmm. thank you for that very uh, candid question. Um, I'm really grateful yeah. for your trust. And thank you, Kelly, for that very, very supportive and, uh, and powerful answer. Um, friends, if you're new to the forum, those are examples of, uh, of Q&A box questions. Now I'd like to introduce you to a video question from Rachel Niemer. Now she's coming from the University of Michigan, which is uh, my alma mater. So naturally she is a brilliant person. Let's see if we can get her up on stage. Hello, Rachel. Uh, hey, Brian, good to see you. Uh, hi, hey. Kelly, nice to meet you, see you. Hi, um, Rachel. I'd love to hear from your perspective at um, AOCNU and PCAL. What are you seeing HBCUs do at the classroom and co-curricular level that you wish PWI, primarily white institutions, would do? And how can if we think of, if we anthropomorphize our institutions, how can primarily white institutions be better allies or accomplices for HBCUs for students in STEM? Wow, that's a lot. OK, so I'll take the, the first part, um, what, I see, what I see them do that I wish everyone did. And um, I taught at an HBCU for 17 years. And one of the things that I often share with, uh, with colleagues is you would be surprised at what I had to do to reach my students. I identify as a Black woman, the majority of my students were black women. I would be embarrassed to tell you the television shows I watched hmm. so that I could make a connection 
with them. I'd be embarrassed to tell you the music that I had to listen to, what I had to go through to learn hip hop lyrics, just so I could have a conversation with them, just so I could be in their world, even if for a little bit, just so that they knew I was trying right. to be in their world. And it took a lot of time and it was painful, right? I like to listen to gospel music on my way to work and having some, some dude screaming at me to this hellacious beat in the morning, it, it was painful, but I had to at least get the stanza <laughs> so, so that I knew. Um, and I'll tell you an, another story. Uh, so, so my campus was very remote. It's in the rural part of Maryland. And um, we didn't have cable TV. They didn't have cable TV on campus. So they would watch movies all the time. They'd watch the same movies over and over and over and over again. And they'd memorize lines in the movies. And just out of nowhere, somebody would just say a line in the movie and then they would all just start cracking up. And I wouldn't get the joke. So I had to start watching those movies too. And I'd have to watch them over and over and over and over again until I became fluent in just dropping lines from the movies. So the thing that was um, pervasive amongst my colleagues and I who uh, mentored, advised a lot of students was just that. The extent that we went to, to live in their world and to not make the assumption that because I'm black and you're black, we understand each other. Yes, we understand some lived experience, but I'm a little older than you I watched different cartoons growing up. So that's the first one. Um, and that's, I think, just one thing. Um, that's a small thing that, that we all can do. And then in terms of, of being allies, I think that there's just a range of things. I think um, being an, an, an ally, uh, being an accomplice um, means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And it's also very contextual and historical and rooted in age old traditions. Um, so there is often, um, where there is an HBCU, there's often a nearby predominantly white institution and they are usually separated by train tracks. And that meant something when those train tracks were built, right? It was intended to separate, not just the institutions, but also, also to separate the communities. And so it's, it's not as simple as I'll just call Dr. So-and-so over there at HBCU and we'll partner. But it's also about understanding all of that context that's surrounding both institutions and, and doing the work that allows you to move past that. And so without you know, knowing any specifics, um, about the institutions that you're thinking about. It, it, what I will just offer to you here is that being willing to do the kind of work that I talked about with my students, the kind of work that says, I'm gonna study this and show myself worthy. I'm not just gonna show up and say, hey, <laughs> hey, I'm Kelly, I'm Dr. Mack and, and I wanna be your friend but I'm gonna earn that. I'm, I'm gonna work at it. I'm going to pay attention to what it is that you do, what you like, what you need. And I'm going to move out of my own comfort, out of my own world and try and exist in yours. I'm gonna make an effort and I'm going to make such a bold effort that you're able to see and sense what it is that I am attempting to do and that you also sense how authentic my intention is. I really appreciate your wise counsel and um, candor. Thank you. Oh, thank you for the question and and for like the um, trip down memory lane. Mm. <laughs> I can imagine. Thank you, Rachel. Take care. Um, and again, if you'd like to join us on stage, it, it's that easy. You don't have to be from the University of Michigan to be allowed on stage. Well, uh, welcome anybody. Uh, so uh, as long as you've got a question. Uh, and speaking of which, we have uh, a couple more. Um, okay. And 
and thank you, by the way, Kelly, for that really, really great answer, uh, which is making me reconsider my television choices. Um, <laughs> we have a, a, another um, question here from the Q&A box, and this is from uh, Elaine Bernal. What are your recommended strategies for building a sense of community online? I teach chemistry for non-science majors, and I've been a lecturer for over 15 years. Yeah, so um, it's hard, but I've seen it done. Um, and I, I have the, the benefit of having seen it done masterfully. Uh, the speakers and presenters that we bring in for our institutes um, are highly skilled at taking what they would normally do in person and bringing it into uh, a virtual space. Um, so a couple of things that we advise new speakers to do. Whatever you're thinking about doing, cut it in half. Mm. Um, just like when mm. um, people who pack really well <laughs> will tell people who don't pack really well, put everything out that you want to take and then just put half of it back in the drawer. Only take half of that. And the reason is that it just takes longer in the virtual space. Um, mm. The other thing is that we often see um, new speakers coming into this space who will take the in-person experience and just do it in the virtual space and it doesn't translate well. Yeah. And what we've had to do, um, even in my own office, is just come to terms with the fact that virtual is a totally different animal. It, it is just, it is different. And we took a year to wipe everything clean and just build it again and build it in the virtual space. And so, you know, if, if you've been doing something one way for so long and you, you just want to do it virtually, you, you just want to like just show it. And, and that doesn't always um, bode well for the presenter, for the, for the professor. It doesn't bode well for students either or for uh, workshop attendees. And so my recommendation would be everything that you know to be true about presenting chemistry, scrap that and then build it all over again mm. in the virtual space. Mm -hmm. And it will be much more meaningful. It'll be much more targeted. Um, the time that you spend face to face will be so much richer. And then I think um, along those same things, the other recommendation that I would have would be to um, maximize the time that you are face to face. So I know we like breakout rooms um, and you know, kind of putting people in, into smaller groups to, to build community. Um, but platforms like this are our friend because they allow us to feel a different experience other than um, your, your typical Zoom meeting where it's just black and then some squares. Mm -hmm. um, but just this, you know, thing, these squares shifting around, um, mm -hmm. seeing people move and, and just a different experience altogether, much like what you would want to do in person, right? Mm -hmm. So if you, you have lectures and you want to spice it up a little bit, you would come in and have different exercises for students to do. So using different platforms then kind of is the same thing. It students a little something different to look at. Um, different places to draw their attention. Um, it's not easy no matter what you do. And I think we also have to just acknowledge and honor that prep time is ridiculously longer mm -hmm. than anything that we've ever um, known in the past. And giving ourselves some grace around that Right, giving ourselves some some grace that says I, I won't have the entire syllabus figured out by the time the semester starts, like I usually do. Right. I think is also very very important. I appreciate that question because it's 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 real, right? And and it's part of the the stress and the overwhelm that we're all feeling right now. I think everybody appreciates both the question and your answer. Uh, Elaine, thank you very, very much for that yes. uh, very important question and good luck. And, um, and thank you, Kelly, for that very detailed and practical question.
Um, we have more questions coming in. I want to make sure we get a, everyone a chance okay. to at least one. And this is one from our dear friend, Roxanne Riskin, who circles back to the mindfulness question. Okay. She asks, as a mindfulness educator, oh, hang on a second. Uh, I'm actually going to need to read this question out loud a second time because I can't see it. Hang on. As a mindfulness educator, uh, I'm, in t I'm excited to hear if you're introducing mindfulness practices as a regular practice. Are you seeing more mindfulness practices becoming welcomed in the university and college level? Yes and no. <laughs> um, and I say yes and no, and you probably know this as well. Uh, once you start practicing mindfulness, other mindfulness practitioners show up in your space hmm. and you commune together. And those who don't have an appreciation for it, they don't show up in your space. So it's hard to gauge whether or not um, there's more. It's also hard for me to gauge whether or not um, there is more mindfulness practice because I am uh, paying attention to it more now than I was yeah. before. Um, and it, it could very well be that it was always there. Um, there are uh, mindfulness groups um, comprised of academics. They, they meet uh, several times a year uh, and they've been meeting for, for decades, right? I just didn't know about them. Um, but I am, I am grateful that at least in some circles, at least at some points, things like mindfulness are making their way, not just into the academy, but into the STEM academy. So if you can imagine um, individuals who are conditioned to believe and, and, and to understand that they don't have any influence over data, that they don't have any influence over analysis of data, or over the content that they teach, when in fact we do have some influence um, because we are the ones conducting the research, because we are the ones showing up in front of the classroom and the bodies in which we are showing up to teach what we have to teach. So, so just knowing that at any level, mindfulness is beginning to penetrate these cultures and beginning to penetrate these environments is just extraordinary from from what i can tell and i am learning patience um i am i am learning that it might be a while before there is a groundswell or a critical mass of us um, who are looking to more meditative kinds of ways of approaching this work but i'm encouraged by it i really really am well thank you Thank you. That's a really subtle answer. And, and thank you for it. And thank you, Roxanne, for the question. My bet is we'll see more of this come uh, as we grapple with climate change. Um, yeah. but, you know, but building on that, we have uh, a great question from our wonderful friend, uh, Stephen Ehrman. Uh, and Steve has a Steve has a wonderful book out, um, which we're going to bug him about in a bit. But let's put him on stage to ask a question about okay. reading classes and how students develop. So let me see if I can bring him up. Hello, Stephen. Hi, Kelly. Hi, Stephen. Um, what I'm interested in is what it takes to change programmatically with regard to DEI issues in STEM. Um, in the past, I've, I've done some work on STEM and especially engineering education. Uh, I've had a sense that one of the uh, least correlates of people holding back is a belief that good students are born, not made, or at the very least that to the extent they're going to be good or not, or good at STEM or not, that's all been determined by the time they were admitted. So if you want to improve outcomes, you admit better students. Um, and against that backdrop of assumption, it's okay to have filter courses, for example, whose filter out the fit from the, from the unfit. Um, I'm curious, for institutions that you know that have seriously tried to change the culture um, uh, in this way, to what extent they either uh, confront that question, you know, is this, are you implying this, what makes you think so, here's some relevant research, versus just looking 
let's say, as, a, as an arbitrary second choice, uh, at the outcomes of that practice. Look at the human carnage that's created um, amongst the students who um, were judged not worthy and then didn't make it. Look at what it did to them. Um, at an institution like ours, can we really just say, oh, that's on them, that's on the schools they went to, nothing to do with us? I mean, what sorts of things do people do when they're trying to change culture around DEI issues in STEM at a programmatic level? My all-time favorite example, Stephen, comes from Wright State University. Hmm. Uh, the dean there is Nathan Klingbeil. And they were struggling with um, African-American student success in engineering. And the disparity was, was distinct. Mm -hmm. um, black students were just not getting through. And what I like about their approach was that they started with some fundamental questions, same ones that you're asking now. Why is it us? And and they and to be like answer that honestly. Is it us? Is it them? And um, the approach was more than well. Let's teach this way, or let's tweak this, or let they scratch the whole engineering program, like the whole course sequence, the entire curriculum, the entire four-year curriculum. And they started from scratch. And the kinds of questions that they asked were questions like, who said you have to take engineering one before engineering two? Who said that? Who said you have to take calculus in the spring mm -hmm. instead of the fall. Who, who said this was the sequence? Mm -hmm. And when they started to answer those questions, <laughs> A, nobody knew who said it. <laughs> <laughs> but then what emerged from that, what emerged from that was a curriculum that says, here is what we know they need. They don't need the whole semester of mm -hmm. calculus. They need this module mm -hmm. of calculus. Um, and, and I might be getting the subjects wrong, but but you get the gist of what I'm saying. I'm not an engineer, okay. so I don't know that curriculum very well. But when they did all of this, when they really critically looked at everything and questioned everything, they made no assumptions. And they were honest about what they didn't know. What emerged from that was a curriculum that was so culturally responsive to the students that were coming in the door. Not the students that everybody said they wanted, but the students that were coming in the door. Mm -hmm. And they all but saw the disparity, not just um, uh, lessen or decrease, but reverse. Mm -hmm. And it's just an extraordinary uh, story that they have. So it's, it's Nathan Klingbeil, K-L-I-N-G-B-E-I-L, -I -I and he's at Wright State University, and they uh, had NSF funding for this, so you could also go to the NSF Award database and, and look at their abstracts, or, I mean, Nate, Nate's a really cool guy, too. You just call him up, um, and he will tell you their story, because it's, it's just remarkable, and I, and I just really like the process that they that's, went through. That's terrific, and I will follow up. Okay, great. Great question, Stephen, and um, thank you for that wonderful example, Kelly. Uh, yeah. in, the, in the chat, I threw a link to Stephen's book. I'm going to have to berate him and get him back oh. on the phone just because it's a, it's, a, it's a unique and very, very useful book. Um, and uh, Kelly, that's, that's twice today. You've talked about tearing something down and starting it from scratch. Yeah. That's a, it's an important theme. Mm -hmm. We have just two minutes left, okay. and a former student of mine has a really good question. Let okay. me just squeak this in under the wire because he's a brilliant sure. guy. I always okay. want to hear from him. This is Andrew Zubiri who says, there's a, um, whoop, hang on a second. There's a move towards more inclusive and sensitive lectures and case studies, such as gender and race neutral examples when discussing human diseases. Any other advice specific to med schools? 
Mm. Um, other than other than case studies, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, so in two minutes, history, the history of medicine, the history, knowing the history, and who played what role, and who played what role in marginalizing and silencing others is extraordinary. Um, and there is a a woman. Oh, she's at Yale University. I just recently learned about her work. I think her name is Roberts. Um, if I can follow up with you, Brian, I'll, I'll send you um, the name because she's got a really great YouTube video and, and she talks about this often. Um, but it, she talks about how, how even slaves um, were medical doctors and how their science and their medicine was totally excluded from the story of medicine. And then the ways in which she has used her knowledge of history and shared it with postdocs, STEM postdocs and STEM graduate students. And um, what I am learning is that from my, uh, my colleagues who have seen this is the response from graduate students and postdocs who are excelling and thriving because they have a sense now of the contributions of their communities to that which they are studying. And the entire population of students, white and black, also understands that what they are learning is not the end all and be all of medicine, right? So, so we are better off because it means when I go into the emergency room, I'm gonna get an ER doc who has more at his disposal that he can use to treat whatever it is that I'm showing up with at the time. So history is the, the short answer to that. Well, that's a powerful answer. Um, and, and Kelly, I'll definitely follow up um, uh, after this about that. The chat has just lit up with uh, different ideas. Folks are asking about the assumptions about STEM, how it's different, how it's similar. Uh, thank you, uh, Karen. Uh, Rachel has a link to uh, uh, Nathan, uh, King Bell's uh, TED Talk uh, on engineering oh, math, and Heidi links to one Carolyn Roberts, and, uh, and we'll find out if that's it. But yeah. we have just blasted past the top of the hour. That is a testimony to just how thoughtful, but also how generous you are, Kelly, with your answers to all of these these questions. Thank you so much for being a Thank terrific you. guest. Uh, what's, Thank what's, you, Brian. Oh, it's it's our pleasure. What's what's the best way to keep up with you and uh, and all your work with AC and you? Um, so the best way is uh, through our AACNU website. Um, so mm -hmm. anything about uh, institutes and when they're happening and our conferences. Um, and then I also have Twitter. Um, I am at Dr. Kelly Mack on Twitter. And um, I, I hope that you all start tweeting me because I need to do more tweeting. Um, my staff is, is trying to teach me. I'm a slow learner. Right. But right. if I can talk to you, I'd feel much better <laughs> about engaging. Okay, well, well, we'll tweet some stuff at you. I'm sure okay. you'll get a whole barrage. Um, <laughs> thank you, thank you again, and good luck with this great work over the next year. Thank uh, we you have so to much. Bring you back. Yeah. Thanks, away. everybody. Oh, that's great. Um, don't go away yet, friends. Let me just point you to the next couple of weeks. Uh, again, we've got uh, topics coming up, including rethinking learning, rethinking the university, eco media literacy, and more. Uh, if you'd like to keep talking about these issues, everything from mindfulness to how to teach online to STEM education uh, and how to support the link between faculty and staff uh, who are dealing with DEI issues, please keep us going. Uh, we're happy to, to conduct this on Twitter. Use the hashtag FTTE or just tweet at me or at Shindig Events. If you'd like to dive into the past, into our previous discussions with other guests about these issues, just head to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive and subscribe. You can find more. Um, and above all, please stay safe. Uh, this fall is becoming stranger and stranger and perhaps more dangerous. I hope all of you take good care of yourselves. Thank you so much for your questions, your thoughts, your comments today. It's been a real pleasure. We'll see you next time online. Bye-bye.